So previously we have finished uh, discriminant analysis and ended uh, our lecture with some discussion on the limitations of uh, DA. Today I want to review those limitations, but also going to talk about some advantages of some of the procedures we learned. In addition, I will uh, discuss some uh, procedures uh, for uh, LDA or naive base or QDA when the dimension is high. One is just to use some screening procedures to reduce your um, potential parameter, uh, potential variables. In general, I do not recommend QDA unless n is relatively large and your dimension p is, is small. Uh, when you do believe uh, the covariance structure of you know within different groups are small, sorry are, are different. You want to use QDA, and then I would su suggest you to take a look of RDA. And I'll give you a rough idea. And there is a R package for RDA. So here's a quick review on the discriminant analysis where we learn the joint distribution of x and y by learning the orange component x given y and the purple component, the margin of y. And then we put them together, we can calculate the conditional probability y given x, which is a key quantity we will use to construct our classifier. Depending on how we estimate a model x given y, and we could have QDA, LDA, or a naive base. Let's consider uh, a binary classification problem, and our data will look like this. Uh, the data are from two groups, y is equal to 1 or 0, uh, blue or red, and we, for every observation we have a p-dimensional feature vector x. If you are from class 1, and I color those features as in blue, and if you are from class 0, and the features are colored in, in red. And here are the parameters we need to estimate for LDA. They are mu1, you can think about that's the average of those blue lines, p-dimensional, and mu2 would be the average of those red uh, lines, which basically are mu0. We have our sigma, which is the p by p co within class covariance matrix, estimated based on the data. We have pi1, which is a percentage of um, y and being 1. Um, for height for LDA, uh, when p is large, the high dimension setting, I always worry about the overfitting uh, problem. Um, at the beginning, it seems uh, we should. It seems like we don't do not need to worry about overfitting because all those quantities or parameters we're estimating here, like the means and the covariance, they are just uh, simple summary statistics. For example, every element of sigma is just some kind of a covariance uh, or variance based on, 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 the, on two variables. Mm. So um, the estimation error should be small, relatively. Uh, however, we should be aware that although uh, every element of sigma can be estimated reliably, but because what we need in our calculation is the inverse of sigma, and that part um, can generate a lot of uh, uh, errors. And to understand that uh, the difficulty with the you know the inverse, let's consider something you know related but slightly different uh, problem. How accurately we can estimate the first principal component direction? Here, uh, I generate data x one through x n. They are i i d from normal zero sigma square sigma sigma is a is a p by p matrix. So the true sigma would be a diagonal matrix. The first element is 2 and the remaining are all 1. So we know the, 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 the principal component, if it's computed based on the true sigma, will be just the first dimension, 1, 0, 0. So um, on the left, I um, include the script we used to, and um, we're going to do the simulation. We generate 500 observations. And I try different dimension p. So p is going to equal to 10, to, uh, 20, 30, all the way to uh, 300. And then uh, we're going to go through the loop. Um, we grab our dimension p. And then we're just going to generate 
uh, 500 observations from this from normal zero sigma. I first generate just uh, x will be just iid normal zero one, and then I times the first dimension by square root of two. So now the first dimension of x and the variance for the first dimension is actually two. Then I compute the covariance sample covariance matrix and do a singular value decomposition and extract the first um, principal component direction. And then I compute the correlation between the estimated PC, the first PC, and the true PC, which basically is equal to um, the first element of the estimated uh, direction. Then I plot the correlation. Actually, I plot the absolute value of the correlation because uh, in the calculation, sometimes the sign could flip. So I, we care just the absolute value of the correlation. I plot the correlation over those either, uh, simulation studies uh, versus the sample size. Uh, sorry, it's actually not versus the sample size. should versus the dimension P. So you can see the correlation when, when, the, when, when P is relatively small, we can reliably estimate the uh, first uh, PC direction. But when the sample size, sorry, when P gets larger and larger, um, the correlation is getting smaller and smaller, meaning the error is, is really large. Um, but um, you might be wondering, uh, well, wait a minute. We actually do not need the whole sigma inverse matrix to be accurate. What we need is, because in our calculation, what's relevant is sigma inverse and times mu1 minus mu2. So um, all we care is the inner product between sigma inverse and with a particular vector, which is mu1 minus mu2. So we do not need the whole matrix to be accurate in terms of you know every aspect like singular value decomposition. Um, well, that's exactly the point I made at the end of last lecture. For LDA, the essential parameter we care is actually a, a p, p plus one dimensional parameters. We need the intercept and we need another p dimensional vector, which is uh, sigma inverse times mu one minus mu two. So we should consider some procedures where we directly estimate those parameters. Because uh, in LDA, and we estimate them sort of independently and then just put them together. So it's hard to control uh, the final arrow, which is actually the, uh, the product of those two. So for example, um, next week we'll talk about logistic regression or tree model, or SVM. Those are the algorithms. They just directly learn this conditional probability of y given x instead of learning, uh, you know, the joint from different pieces and then, uh, you know, get the conditional uh, from the joint. Um, another concern you might have is that, well, um, for LDA, QDA, even naive base, well, naive base, you can drop the normality assumption. Well, you do. You have you have normality assumption uh, for the parametric case. So for all those discriminant analysis procedure, when we estimate the conditional distribution of y given x, sorry, x given y, we always make this normal assumption, meaning we model the feature x within each class as a, uh, you know, as a Gaussian distribution. Uh, shouldn't that be something we need, uh, you know, we need to worry because in a lot of cases, the data are not normally distributed. It turns out that's not, uh, the normality assumption is not a big problem. Um, this is just some, uh, I want to give you some intuition. Uh, I don't mean to ask you to read this paper, this technical paper. When we all apply LDA, uh, we're always going to do some projection somewhere in, in the algorithm. So it turns out for high dimensional data, when we are looking at its low dimensional projections, the normality assumption is sort of approximately true. The low dimensional um, projections are um, approximately normally distributed. And the intuition is basically the central limiting theorem. So what is the central limiting theorem? Central limiting theorem is saying, I have a bunch of observation, um, x1, and xn, 
they are i i d and i do uh, i and times one over square root of n this will eventually converge to normal zero and some kind of a variance even though the original distribution of x1 through xn uh, and is not normal and the same idea can be applied to the case where and the distribution of x1, the x1 through xn are not necessarily iid. They are just some kind of, the, the x1 through xn can follow different distribution. And what we're going to do is just to add them together using weights. One In this case, is weights 1 over square root of n. So that's a, that's a weight vector. The norm is 1. But you can imagine you can use a, a different type of weights. And so you can show, you can show that um, in the high dimensional case, when p is getting large, when we do some kind of a weighted average over those p dimensions, and then the resulting uh, summary um, will behave like normal. So in this case, high dimension um, is not a curse, but a blessing, because when p gets large, we can apply, and uh, since we'll, we can get something similar to a CLT. Okay, so um, let, let's, um, Let's talk up. Let's just uh, get to this page where uh, I have at the end of my last lecture, and after uh, at the end of lecture, I summarize that uh, you know discriminant analysis is conceptually simple and works for some low-dimensional problems, um, but it won't be very effective um, if your problem, even you know, for some um, complicated classification problems. And especially won't work very well, you know, if you have data like, uh, you know, lending club where your features has a lot of a mixture of, you know, categorical variables and numerical variables.